Welcome, dear colleagues and friends, to our seminar on building gender-friendly and funding gender-friendly infrastructure. Cities and local governments are on the front line to tackle and address global challenges such as the climate crisis, gender inequality, poverty and informality. The small and medium-sized cities have particularly played a major role for an inclusive, resilient, and sustainable recovery from COVID-19. From the COVID-19 for this reason, there's been a tendency recently to refer to cities as the best placed actors to act on and localize the sustainable development goals, which we collectively refer to as SDGs. Cities can provide services to their citizens and to them by Sorry, cities can provide services to their citizens and to nearby areas. They can offer economic opportunities for individuals and enterprises. They have a major role in the protection of nature, 
and inter adaptation and mitigation of climate change in planet. At the same time, cities often overlooked in national strategies and international cooperation programs. They face enormous constraints in terms of data, financing, policy, and capacity when they have to act and implement solutions to crisis. We're here today with different actors, including governments, international NGOs, UN agencies, etc., to try and understand how to get how we can strengthen cities' role, capacity, and resources in order to ensure they can continue having this role. In the fight against poverty, climate change, and in the localization of all SDGs. While certain aspects of relevant development work or cities are widely recognized, for example, the following the importance of bottom up and gender sensitive participatory approaches to the necessity to design green and resilient public spaces with data based solutions. Three, the importance of involving civil society, the private sector, academia, and all relevant <coughs> stakeholders to ensure inclusivity. There are still many challenges and barriers to address to ensure the sustainable, inclusive, and resilient development of societies around the world. These challenges include, one, increased financial and technical constraints within the public sector. Two, lack of coordination with the private sector. Three, the process of centralization of power and four level of gender sensitive data and knowledge. We are here today and we hope to hear from our speakers about innovative and flexible approaches, <laughs> mechanisms and partnerships for the mobilization of resources and also new solutions for improved design and construction processes. Charlotte McClay again, the South, a South African woman who was the first black woman to get a university degree, said the following. If you definitely and earnestly set out to lift women and children up in social life, you'll find the men will benefit and thus the whole community. I will leave now the word to our moderator, Dr. Sen Pillai, for the introduction <coughs> of our guests. Thank you. Thank you very much for your kind words and uh, wise words of introduction for, for this session. And thank you uh, to Cities Alliance and UNOPS for inviting me to, to moderate uh, this session. My name is San Bilal from uh, ECDPR. Uh, and I think we have here a very prestigious uh, panel uh, to share different perspectives and, and lights on, on this important process of, uh, uh, of inclusive cities development. Um, we are really in a situation where not only we have already a lot of cities, uh, but the urbanization process is also growing at a very fast pace. So half of, more than half of the population already lived in cities, and uh, you know, by 2050 we expect that uh, I think 70% of the population will live in cities. So the way we design cities and the interaction of cities with their ecosystem, with their geographical ecosystem, is really key. Uh, it is key how to adjust the current cities, but also how we move uh, we move forward. And, and so the notion of being uh, having green, resilient, inclusive cities is really something that is 
really core. And I would like to comment really the organizers because uh, I work on a lot of issues related to development and, and sometimes gender just becomes as a, an afterthought. <laughs> it's very nice and, and, and important to not, we're not just talking about gender mainstreaming, but saying, okay, how do you have gender-led uh, approaches to cities' development and, and uh, to, to promote their inclusiveness and, and their resilience uh, it is really something uh, really key. So without further ado, let's uh, turn to some of the challenges that, uh, that exist and some of the initiatives. We were talking about the need to identify new initiatives. Uh, I, I will introduce perhaps one by one. We'll have this, the, the, the panelists uh, making first uh, statements. So I'll introduce them uh, one by one when they make their first statements, and then we will have a bit of discussions. But let me turn to uh, Eloisa Astudillo, who is the Deputy Head of Cooperation at the EU Delegation in Nepal. Uh, I think you're the perfect person to both tell us, you know, what's the EU approach more generally, and also what you're doing in, uh, uh, in Nepal in this context. Thank you, Sam. So hello everybody, I'm Eloisa Estudillo. I work in the delegation in Nepal. I was working before in Haiti and even before in uh, Mauritania and I am a training uh, an architect and urban planner. So these are questions that are extremely important uh, for me. I will do more of a general uh, introduction of why, what is the case for investing in urban development and especially thinking about integrated urban development and how uh, tackling this approach when we can have thematic entry points, whether it's infrastructure for water or disaster, disaster risk reduction. When we look at it in an, in an integrated approach, we can solve many, many more issues and especially not create new problems. Uh, and especially the question of how to integrate uh, and how to make sure that, that spaces and, uh, and infrastructures that we are creating are benefiting everybody is extremely important and that cannot be done only by looking at the questions from a thematic entry point. So it's really about having diverse stakeholders. So first of all, let's look at South and Southeast Asia. As Sam mentioned, uh, the, the rate of urbanization in the world is very high. And if we look especially for South and Southeast Asia, is So we can see that if, if you look at this graph, this is uh, the South uh, East Asia Pacific uh, region, and we can see that South and South uh, South and Southeast Asia are the ones that are the least uh, the least uh, urbanized and the ones that are urbanizing really rapidly. And this means that we have right now a very specific window of opportunity to really influence this urbanization. Because, uh, I'm sorry to contradict you, Sam, <laughs> you were talking about designing the growth. But in fact, this growth is usually not designed. It just happens. And when it just happens, it happens in the wrong ways. And this is where we are creating inequalities and we are creating areas that have a lot of um, prone to disasters, uh, where poverty is increasing. So we have a very specific window of opportunity of action in these areas in uh, South, Southeast Asia. So in particular, Nepal is the most rapid urbanizing country in, in the world. And we are very lucky that in Nepal, right now, there are very few slums and very few zones of us compared to, let's say, India, where we know this is a very, very big issue. And in India, it's only going to grow because it's also one of the highest urbanizing areas. I mean, four of the biggest 10 cities in the world are in South, in, in, in South Asia. So that's Dhaka, Delhi, Mumbai, and Kolkata. And those are cities where the issues of inequality are extremely big. So this is why the case for investing in, in and actually doing this designing of this growth 
is extremely important and we can do it now, but we will not be able to do it in 10 years. So just uh, <laughs> to kind of impart the sense of urgency that there is on, on, on this question. But of course, it's not just about preventing problems. We are also creating opportunities. So we know that in the Asia Pacific region, growth is led by cities. So 40% of the population who are the urban population are actually responsible and contributing to 80% of GDP in the area. So we know that cities are a very, very strong engine of growth and economic development. Also, high population densities can create a lot of efficiencies and can reduce pressure on natural resources. So that means that if the, if the uh, frontier between, uh, let's say, natural areas and cities is well managed, then we can really preserve the natural areas and really support uh, or try to preserve as much uh, biodiversity as we can. Uh, and also, uh, which is quite interesting, is in South and, and Southeast Asia, most of the growth is internal migration. So that means rural populations are going to urban areas. What that means actually is that there is a reinvestment in rural areas because there are remittances that are being sent back. So it's not, uh, it's not a zero sum game. It's not that people are leaving and then rural areas are losing. They are losing some people, but they are still getting money back. So this is actually something that can, be, can promote a better territorial balance uh, in terms of growth. Next. <laughs> But of course, there is also huge challenges with this, uh, with this. Sorry. So first of all, how to make these cities sustainable and especially environmentally sustainable. I, I mean, we have, I don't even need to mention the summer that we just spent uh, to, for all of you to understand what are the challenges that we are seeing now and how these challenges are going to increase. Uh, I mean, we can talk about heat and urban heat islands. We can talk about air quality with all the fires that we have had all over the world. We can talk about flooding, etc. Uh, urban, uh, so waste management and also its impact in, in, in urban disasters. So really, the question of sustainability of cities is at the center, especially if you're increasing the, the population living in cities. Of course, especially in South and Southeast Asia, extremely vulnerable to natural disasters. Uh, we know of whole cities that are now uh, being um, under extreme duress, and well, we know that the government of Indonesia is now planning to move from Jakarta, because Jakarta is going to be flooded. This is the, the <clears throat> what is being foreseen. Uh, and of course, the areas that are most prone to disasters are usually the most vulnerable areas in the city. So usually the areas where there are slums, the areas that were not built first. Uh, we have also seen extreme images of flooding all over Europe, all over the world in the past few days. And this is, this is a challenge that's even higher and more uh, and, uh, increased in, uh, in, in cities in, uh, in Southeast Asia. Also, where cities provide a lot of opportunities for economic growth, they, are also, they can also exacerbate inequalities. So in 2010, I didn't find more recent figures, 30.6% of urban population was living in slums. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the definition of a slum, a slum is, uh, I think it has to combine two or three of these uh, characteristics, which is non-durable housing, whether because you don't own it or you don't legally rent it, because the infrastructure of the building is not, uh, to say, uh, durable, uh, that it doesn't have sufficient um, surface uh, for everybody in the family living there, and that there is no access to water, sanitation, or waste management. So when you put together three of these characteristics, this means you live in Islam. Uh, 
And often, slums means no access to uh, to public services. So normally, not only no access to water and sanitation, but usually less schools, very few health centers. So the opportunities that exist of living in a city where things are more compact, and there is a density, are really reduced in a slum. I mean, uh, when I was in Haiti, some people had to still walk one and one hour or one hour and a half to get water living in water prints because they were living in a slum. So this is this is just uh, a very important issue. Uh, and then poverty now is growing faster in urban areas than in rural areas. And of course the 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 essence of urban poverty is quite different and its impacts is also are also quite different than rural poverty. So I will go maybe a little faster about what we talk when we talk about integrated urban development. So what do we mean by that? It's really taking into account that complex issues are interconnected. So it's not just you cannot just do a water project or you, you cannot just do an uh, electricity project, especially when you're working in an urban area, because there are many other factors that come into it. So you really have to look at it and tackle it in all its complexity. And how do you do that? The first and the most important thing is to have different experts. There is not one expert in uh, integrated urban development. You need people with different backgrounds, with different knowledge, with different, uh, different uh, decision capacity. So you can have elected leaders, you can have uh, bureaucrats, as they like to say in Nepal, you can have civil society, and, uh, and then you can have different kinds of experts, different engineers, architects, sociologists, economists, etc. And then bringing together all these different expertise, also lawyers, because <laughs> usually these are very complex operations, but it's really the idea of putting all these expertise together and then trying to, to tackle problems from very different angles. Then you have to really identify your objectives clearly. And then you never think of what you're tackling alone. You're always trying to see how it fits in a larger area, even if you're not intervening in the larger area. Because again, it's looking at how your project is connecting to the rest of, of the territory. And then, of course, you need to have flexibility. And what does it allow us to do to work this way? And especially, I want to focus on these two points, which is to really tackle unequal access to service and economic opportunities, especially for women and girls. So uh, I was reading recently a study. Uh, girls, when they turn 14, the space that they go to, the, where they move, is two-fifths the size of the space where they moved when they were 11. So girls, when they turn 14, they don't go out as much as they did when they were 11. Their space is one-third of the size of boys their age, the, where they move, where they go. And so this means that the access to the city is much more reduced for girls. Even we know about the questions of transportation, how do you, how do you um, finance transportation, how do you pay for tickets. These are all questions that are, that are actually extremely gendered and extremely important in creating a city that is actually safe and accessible for women and that all the opportunities and services that the city allows are also accessible for women. Then, the other point that this allows us to do is to create innovative solutions to adapt to climate change and even mitigate it. So that means greening, that means sustainable transportation, multimodality, uh, sustainable land use, so looking at where the disaster, what areas are prone to disaster and plan accordingly. And this means that public spaces are often the solution to both questions. So to increase, to use public space as the problem solver for a number of challenges, whether it's mobility, whether it's uh, sustainability, whether it's disaster risk reduction. Um, sorry. <laughs> and then here, very quickly, yes. So I will talk very quickly about what are the opportunities for the European Union. 
So first of all, working on this is that it's policy and governance first. So this means it's really about uh, working with local authorities, which are actually the first step of governance. These are, these are where a credibility of a, of a governance system can start to happen. Uh, you can also have concrete delivery. You have opportunity to mix different types of funding, whether it's grants, whether it's technical assistance, whether it's uh, lending, whether it's uh, loans. And we have also specific and recognized European expertise. And then the European Union has also uh, credibility as a convening power for creating complex operations, to, so to work together with different, with different actors. Of course, we also have challenges uh, linked to, to the EU, because these are complex, complex operations that require time and expertise to execute, and we are always a little bit under our pressure of delivering in short amounts of time. Then we also need innovative and out-of-the-box funding mechanisms to be able to work directly with local governments, which is not always easy. And then we also need to increase the in-house capacity to think about these more complex uh, projects and creating these linkages uh, between the different projects. Uh, yes. So in Nepal, I think, Xavier will uh, present this more in depth. Well, we are preparing a project uh, which we call Cities for Women, where we are working directly with women elected leaders to define and design projects. So we are working both on the disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation through interventions in uh, urban areas, local governance and female leadership, plus the financing of these projects, small scale and larger scale. And then better and safer cities and creating the local capacity for urban planning, which is actually key in order to be able to deliver. And that is it. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much for giving a broad picture of, of, of what is required. I know that, you know, being the expert, you must feel very frustrated still. <laughs> I was asking you to speed no, up no, and, no, no, no. And, 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 and to go to the point, but uh, would we have, in fact, time to, yeah. to, to discuss it's and to go into the, the broader issues? You, you mentioned that it was quite complex to, to, to do uh, what you were saying. There's perhaps no design for uh, cities and uh, it is with natural growth, but it's a complex interaction of different stakeholders and, 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 and different thematics. So it might be perhaps useful to also place that into the broader <coughs> context of the approach of the EU development uh, cooperation and, and, and support. So uh, let's turn to uh, Ian Hoskins, who is uh, in charge of uh, South and Southeast uh, Asia unit at EG uh, INPA. Uh, can you place that kind of work that we're doing in, in cities on cities into the broader perspectives of what the EU is trying to achieve? I can certainly try. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. You've heard from my visa the delegation, EU uh, delegation level um, uh, perspective. I'll try and give you a EU headquarters perspective. Um, as I said, I work in international partnerships. I'm the deputy head of a unit that covers South and Southeast Asia. Eloisa uh, very uh, clearly highlighted the uh, opportunities for urbanization in terms of uh, growth, job creation, productivity gains, which come from cluster, but also the main challenges, which are more on the policy and financing side. How do you ensure adequate housing? How do you ensure adequate infrastructure, basic services? Um, and as was also mentioned, the environmental impacts of um, urbanization, congestion, pollution, etc. Um, so it's a question of reaping the benefits and uh, dealing with the, the cost through effective uh, planning and, uh, and financing. And sometimes these uh, policies, as we've seen, are quite often lacking, uh, sometimes due to lack of resources, lack of capacity, or even lack of um, power at the, at the local level, lack of um, legal framework allowing local authorities to take the necessary decisions. Um, what's the EU approach globally, and where does it fit? Well, I'm going to go right back to high-level objectives, because I work in headquarters, so that's easier for me. And I'll talk about the Commission priorities, and I'll just try and explain how all this fits together. Uh, the main priorities of the Commission, of this Commission, is the green transition, the 
the digital transition, jobs and growth, and human development. Now, in the South, East, in, the, in the Asia Pacific region, we also have the Indo Pacific strategy. You don't have to read the news to see the importance of the Indo Pacific. And uh, we now have an Indo Pacific strategy, like many other uh, partner countries, which highlights the growing importance of that region. And again, we focus on prosperity, connectivity, green transition, security, oceans, and digital. And our overarching strategy is the Global Gateway, which you may have heard about. This seeks to connect the world through sustainable investments and uh, reliable partnerships. And we're implementing this through um, Team Europe uh, with our member states and our uh, European development financial institutions, our partners, as well as trying to mobilize private sector funding. Um, and again, the focus of the Global Gateway is on digital, climate and energy, transport, health and education. So it deals with the hard infrastructure, but also the softer governance elements. Um, and we're trying to build equal partnerships and we're trying to catalyze the private sector. Now you would have heard in the Commission priorities, in the Indo-Pacific strategy objectives priorities, in the Global Gateway, there's a lot of overlap. Digital, green, and uh, all these priorities are um, very similar for good reason. Uh, in terms of urban development cities, um, it's not a core objective of what we do, but clearly all of these priorities of the Commission uh, cut across everything uh, we do in cities as well. Um, success of all these policies depends on uh, what happens in the city. As Eloise has pointed out, uh, the growth is coming from urbanization and how countries respond to this uh, challenges of urbanization in terms of policy and financing will be key to uh, ensuring uh, growth, ensuring green transition, ensuring uh, jobs and growth, uh, and uh, dealing with inequalities and urban sprawl, which are key uh, slums, which are the key issues for um, human development. At the country level, globally, we have around 30 partner countries where we do have uh, uh, a focus on, um, uh, on uh, cities and uh, also with our member states through Team Europe initiatives. Um, and uh, to be honest, most of these are in Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America, not so many in, South, in Southeast Asia, but that's changing, hopefully. <laughs> Certain delegations are realizing the importance. Um, so what do we do to support effective urbanization? As I say, how do we ensure we get the benefits without uh, the costs on uh, gender, on inequality, on uh, human uh, development? Um, firstly, uh, as has been said, the key issue is the deficit in urban governance. And so this is related to the, the institutional role of uh, local government, sometimes limited revenue, limited autonomy, limited ability to raise resources. Um, in the current climate, even at national level, very difficult, and also accountability. Now, we work across the world on strengthening public financial management systems. In the Asia region, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and we work on virtually every country in the region on public financial management. Now, this is the heart of governance of any country, and in many of those countries, we're supporting, uh, through the public financial management support, the decentralization strategies of those countries. And that includes uh, significant capacity building, and uh, I have to say that working on decentralization, if many of you have, is not easy, <laughs> particularly when you start talking about delegating financing and power to the local level. But that is something that many countries have uh, embarked on and we're supporting in Nepal and many other countries, and that is a key issue. And in that, in that context, we work on domestic revenue mobilization, on effective expenditure, um, which is key for um, effective urban policy making and on supporting um, uh, decentralization. Uh, we also support in all regions in the world, the IMF Technical Assistance Centers, including the one in uh, South Asia, uh, which also works on all of these areas with IMF expertise, uh, delivering support to, uh, to ministries in their partner countries. Uh, maybe just to give a few examples of what we're doing on cities. In India, for example, we highlighted that some of the major challenges in India. We work with uh, AFD on our cities program. I won't say too much, but maybe <laughs> Frederick will say a bit more. Um, the first phase active in 12 cities across India, working on IT infrastructure and hospitals and sustainable mobility. Uh, the second phase has recently been agreed and that's moving forward supporting climate uh, resilient urbanization in 15 more cities. Uh, that's a good example of uh, Team Europe in action uh, in the spirit of the uh, Global Gateway. At the regional level, we're working with the International Finance uh, Corporation. Uh, we support access to inclusive and sustainable smart infrastructure services. Um, we have a South Asia Cities platform, which is supporting the improvement of core municipal infrastructure, including solid waste management, green buildings, water security, urban transportation, and also working on the deployment of uh, municipal uh, finance, uh, PPP, uh, Public-Private Partnership Advisory Services, and, and investment. Um, 
Looking, looking forward um, and addressing the challenges requires um, policy support and investment. Um, and we need to uh, ensure that we're uh, encouraged the connectivity within cities, but also between cities. Uh, as I've mentioned earlier, affordable housing, basic services, land rights and land tenure is key. Uh, as Louisa said, these slum areas, there's no land rights, no land tenure, inadequate housing. Um, and uh, while, well, of course, building in disaster resilience, we know many of these cities are in uh, floodplains or deltas or uh, high risk of uh, impacts of climate change. We know that the EU is a grant provider. Grant money is, is although it seems like a lot, it's, it's insufficient to deal with these, uh, these needs. Um, so we need to use our grant money to leverage um, private sector money and, uh, and lending. And our tool for that in the context of um, Global Gateway is the European Fund for Sustainable Development. So therefore, blending, uh, we blend our grants with the loans, for example, AFD, uh, KFW, the European Investment Bank, to, um, uh, to increase the, the volume of uh, financing available while also supporting capacity building and also looking at drawing in the, the private sector as well. Um, and we're trying to support subnational lending, which is not easy, uh, but that's another challenge. So, guarantees can also support uh, working with uh, public private partnerships issuing city bonds, uh, facilitating local currency financing. We have some uh, funds which uh, can uh, de-risk uh, financing uh, uh, using uh, currency swaps. Um, and of course, as I said, technical assistance in preparing the projects, identifying the needs, and then supporting the implementation. So not a core objective, I say, but clearly it cuts across everything we do. And all, uh, all of these green transitions, digital transitions, these twin transitions are key for cities as well as for countries as a whole. So addressing policy challenges while mobilizing finance is the key, and that's what we're working on in the European Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Could you perhaps just say two words on the gender action plan and how the gender dimension is coming into, into the future? I'm going to leave that for other reason. <laughs> sure. <clears throat> now, that's a very important question, because with our gender action plan, uh, maybe I will just focus on how the gender First of all, I would say one of the things that I really appreciate about the Gender Action Plan 3 is that it makes us walk the talk. So there is a lot of actions that are actually inward looking to make sure that our institution is actually doing what we preach. So that I think is very, very nice. Uh, but maybe the second point is that is extremely important uh, is how we have to look at all our projects. And now all of our projects need to be, uh, uh, so is it, what is it? Uh, I, I, I just the name came out of my head. Um, G, GF1, no, GF. So we have to be GF1, that means that one of the specific objectives is about gender. And then if you cannot do that, but you have a good reason, you have to then explain why you have a good reason. And you always need to have, all, for all your projects, whether they are uh, mainstreaming gender or focused only on gender equality, you always need to have a gender sector analysis explaining uh, really how you have taken into account gender. So I think these, these two questions are extremely important because that means that all the different interventions that Ian mentioned need to be backed by a gender sector analysis. So that all the interventions are really understanding what are the power dynamics uh, underlying the different uh, constraints and the different uh, outcomes in each sector, so that projects can actually address them. Thank you. I didn't want you to be too long, but I think it was important to stress this overarching <coughs> gender dimension in, in fact, all activities, including in organization. We talked a lot about the need to um, earn out two elements. I mean, first, the Team Europe approach, that is not just the European uh, Commission, but uh, other EU actors and other international actors uh, that, have, uh, you know, that are working together. The second dimension, perhaps, is you know, the, the need to attract financing. So that's a good way to, to, to turn to uh, Frederic Olaz, who is the head of Urban Development Planning and Housing Department at IFB. Uh, and you have also this uh, uh, urban project finance initiative perhaps that you, you want to, to tell us a few things about. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I will be, I will try to be quick and maybe not respect exactly uh, 
my, my presentation because uh, what uh, the EU visited uh, has said is, is really is really important, and uh, what is important for us <laughs> is uh, to 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 work together, uh, as you said, as you team Europe, and I would say that it works really well uh, in the different regions of the world. Uh, it works in Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia. Uh, so, so I would like to guess to 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 to, to say that first because uh, it's not only theory, theory it's, uh, <laughs> it's not only a political uh, uh, message, but it works practically. Uh, it works for our operation. But that's so. Another view. Uh, yes. Just to say that in AFD, so we, we are a bi, what we call a bilateral agency, uh, a French bilateral agency, working for, for urban development. We are working in uh, 80 uh, different countries all over the world. And uh, my, my team in, uh, in, in headquarters gathers about, yes, let's say 40, 40 people, uh, and five of them. As a class team leader, uh, if you are using the uh, example of uh, World Bank, for example, uh, they are decentralized in Istanbul, in Nairobi, in Bangkok, in Bogota, and since a uh, few days in Lome for, for Western, uh, Western Africa. That is to say that we want to put the people on the ground and have a policy dialogue on the ground, also with all our partners, such as, uh, such as EU. Um, urban development for us, we are working in basic services and infrastructure, uh, informal settlements, human resilience, uh, adaptation, solid waste management, affordable housing, urban heritage, which is quite important uh, in, the urban, uh, in the urban planning. Uh, and also, as it was said before, uh, due to the uh, urban growth, you know, uh, metropolis and the capitals will grow a bit, but what is important, what will be important in the future will be the growth, urban growth in intermediate cities, especially in Africa and in, in Asia. Um, so, let's be quick. Our strategy is based on three uh, strategic goals. First one is improve the quality of life for city dwellers. So, the approach for every citizen, urban citizen. Second strategic goal is to promote sustainable territorial urban development. At least to say that we have the same approach as EU. It's a territorial approach in its complexity. So uh, it's not only financing specific city. It's we don't we don't really um, uh, we are considering the whole territory, and we don't only considering the limits. Of the perimeter, the administrative perimeter of the, of the city, for example. Uh, and last strategic goal is to reinforce local stakeholders in charge of the city, to be cities, to be region, provinces, uh, etc. But we have a transversal approach, which is cities and climate, which is very important. That is to say, mitigation, that is to say, uh, adaptation, and also transforming, transforming our partners. Uh, in a way of a resilience and energy savings of, of cities. Uh, and also, uh, I don't have a specific slide for that, but also uh, gender approach. Uh, if you are going on the AFD site, if you just uh, ask for uh, gender in, uh, in cities, that's the name of the guide, that's something that we did, uh, you can, you can um, download it. Uh, it's based on our experience from all over the world. How do you implement a urban uh, planning project uh, in the participatory approach, including gender approach? For example, uh, when we are preparing urban planning, we ask for association of women to tell us uh, about the design of the, of the projects. We are organizing with uh, local associations, local communities, uh, women march. Uh, that is to say, they will, they will show us uh, many things that, as a European, as a European male of 50 years, let's say, uh, we don't see uh, the problem of security, problem for children, etc. So that's very important. We are doing that uh, uh, when we are preparing uh, local urban labs, uh, especially in Africa and sometimes also in uh, in, in Asia. 
uh, it helps us a lot to, to fit exactly to the needs of the people, to the needs of the communities. Um, so, how do we finance uh, urban, uh, urban actors? First, it's very classic for several loan. We are financing the urban program. And that's, I would say, the main uh, instrument because in many cities, in many countries where we are working, the decentralization uh, framework is not solid, is not robust. So the only way to, to help cities is to go throughout the central government. So we are, uh, we are proposing loans to central governments, and this loan is real lent to, uh, to uh, local, local uh, uh, actors, such as cities or regions. Uh, but I mean, it's not really important because the dialogue is done with the city, directly with the, uh, the urban actor in charge of, uh, of the city. Uh, so it could be also a direct loan, that's a specificity of, uh, for AFD. Uh, internally, we have experts for local finance uh, and for decentralization. So that's, that's my, that was my job first when I came to <laughs> AFD. Um, and uh, we are doing that in, yes. Latin America, I would say, uh, in some countries in Africa, uh, Senegal, uh, Burkina Faso, uh, and in, in Asia, it's not really possible due to the uh, legal framework. Another way is to propose loans or subsidy uh, to spe specialized finance institutions, I mean, local banks, should they be private or public, uh, local banks that will, that will finance uh, directly uh, cities. Uh, and last way, uh, and thanks to EU for that, uh, we have the possibility to uh, propose guarantees uh, to local banks, should they be private or public, uh, in order that they take some risks to finance directly cities. Uh, and we have an example for that in, uh, in, uh, in, in Africa. And also, thanks to you, what I would like to, to uh, point out is that uh, that's an example of what we call CIA and COM SSA. COM SSA is Covenant of Mayors uh, Sub Saharan uh, Africa. Uh, so we benefit from an uh, EU delegation fund uh, to prepare strategies, plan, priority programming, uh, pre feasibility studies, and capacity building and technical assistance for cities in Africa. Uh, so that's very important. There is also the, the uh, Swiss cooperation, and AFD is putting some, some money also in this, uh, in this uh, facility. Uh, it works very well uh, because uh, our job uh, in this case is to transform EU grant, I would say, into investment financing. And it works very well in Africa. Uh, because with CPA and COMSSA, for example, uh, we have uh, 52 cities uh, in 20 uh, sub-Saharan African countries who have benefited from this, uh, <coughs> this uh, facility to prepare the projects. And already 13 investment project committed at board it, with this uh, project preparation facility. It shows that 700 million euros uh, of investment program were financed uh, for, uh, for, uh, for loans here after the preparation facility. Nine more at, 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 uh, at a pre due diligence stage, and uh, potentially a 22 investment representing 1.4 billion euros in IV and co financiers through uh, the World Bank, as a, for example, World Bank or KW or European Investment Bank. So it works very, very well uh, in Africa. And in Asia, in South Asia, uh, we did quite the same uh, mechanism due to crisis COVID. Uh, it, was, it was not easy to, to, to implement it, uh, but we have transformed a few of, uh, of uh, the uh, studies that were financed uh, through EU funds. Uh, for example, in Indonesia, in, uh, in Vietnam also. Uh, so so it, it works to prepare the studies. It works also to, to, have, to prepare the policy dialogue, which is important. And I want to, to for example, to highlight some things also in Asia and East Asia, because it's not easy, <laughs> as you said, uh, because we are all coming with our, with our European point of view, and it's 
taking into account that, uh, yes, the student process is something that should be implemented, etc. But when you are working in Vietnam or in India, etc., you have to face political challenges uh, sometimes. So uh, to have some funds to prepare the policy dialogue in order to finance urban projects is very important at that stage because you are creating confidence you are showing the best experience in Europe. Uh, that's what we are, we are doing, for example, in Vietnam. Uh, that's what we are doing in, in India. And in India, it has worked very well also. Uh, you said it's a fantastic program. Cities with 12 different cities. And now the next one, uh, which was announced on Twitter by the, by the, the Prime Minister in India himself. So, so it, was, it was great. Uh, and it will be focused on solid waste management. Uh, this one with uh, 15 uh, other, other cities in many federal, many states also. So it, it was, and that's something I want yes, to, to highlight. Uh, that's very quick. Uh, we are implementing, yes, but I think it will interest people. Uh, due, uh, thanks to uh, EU, uh, we are also, yes, we are financed, we are putting in place uh, city risk, which is a guarantee for cities sustainable investment. So that's for Africa. What is the idea there is to create this new market, this new access for financing for uh, African cities. We are providing guarantees to uh, public or private banks. This guarantee is counter guaranteed by EU, EU for the EFB. That is to say that we are. Uh, reducing the risk for the local banks, the risk to finance intermediate cities in Africa. So that's very important because also, uh, I, I will give you the presentation, also what is important there is that we are respecting the local currency. When EFD is uh, proposing a loan to, uh, to uh, a city, it's in Euro or in US dollar, or maybe sometimes in local currency, but it's not easy for, for, for us. And in this way, there is no problem for, for currency exchange. This risk is taken, on, I mean, only the local bank is, is taking this, uh, this, this, this risk. We are just offering a guarantee. So there is no uh, currency uh, risk coverage uh, that will be added to the margin of the, of the financier. Sorry, can you just clarify? Last one. Is, uh, just to clarify, yeah. you're landing in local currency or you're landing in foreign yeah, currency but you're covering the public? The no, public we are landing in you. We are covering in, in, uh, in for the guarantee mechanism. We are covering in euro. Uh, you know, euro is strong money. Uh, and usually, uh, I mean, there is absolutely no reason because the local currency certainly will not be higher than euro, so, so, so there is no risk at all. We don't take the risk in swap, for example. Uh, I mean, for, for the local banks, it's, she's completely uh, covered, partially covered by, by, by this mechanism. So that's, that's, that's a very that's good incentive. Local currency yes, local exactly, exactly. Uh, so that's very, uh, that's very important. That kind of mechanism uh, will be also uh, spread into different other different regions. In Asia and in Latin America, uh, we are currently working with EU. We are just finalizing the uh, financial agreement uh, for a specific uh, me a mechanism which is called Fast Cities, uh, to accelerate the financing of urban investment. Um, so it will be the same mechanism. Uh, we will offer a uh, guarantee to local banks. And if it's necessary, there will be a possibility for, for us, let's say, to, for example, to finance directly a city uh, asking a partial guarantee from EU. That is to say that AFD, if we don't have this guarantee, we will not finance because it's too risky for us. Uh, but if we get partial guarantee from EU, we will take the risk. So that's very important, I mean, to, uh, yes, to create this incentive and to accelerate the financing of uh, local governments. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you a lot. You're doing a lot uh, at IFD, so I know it's difficult to, to, to cover it all in, uh, in, in a few minutes. But thanks for pointing out uh, these elements, of course, respecting also the, 
you know, the, the local governance and, and providing in local currency uh, some of the funding is, is really key. Let's uh, I understand that Sophie uh, De Koenig is online. Uh, she's the global manager of a local initiative at UNCDF. And she's joining us from, I'm not sure where she is based. I'm in Kampala, Uganda. Thank you in very Kampala. much. <laughs> Thanks a lot for joining us. The floor is yours. Letting me connect. Thank you very much. Uh, so there are a few slides that should be projected. I know that we are a bit short in time. Uh, first, perhaps for while we retrieve the slide. So my name is Sophie de Conning. I work for the UN Capital Development Fund, which is a, a specialized agency of the UN with a, a financial mandate. And essentially, uh, by its size, we are more focused on least developed countries, but also perhaps being a first mover uh, on a range of financial instruments and, and in particular in the field of uh, municipal finance and decentralization. So today I was asked by the organizer to present a particular initiative. So UNCDF works on municipal finance and local government finance. It ranges from decentralization with grant finance to also um, you know, uh, testing municipal bonds in countries like Tanzania or um, handing over the first reimbursable grants to uh, cities in Morocco. But for this purpose, I've been asked to focus on a particular instrument that is looking especially at uh, climate change adaptation. It is an initiative called Local Climate Adaptive Living Facility, uh, essentially uh, introduced with support from the EU and, and member states and um, across a range of countries. I'll come to that uh, quite quickly. If we move to the first slide, uh, perhaps just to reiterate, it's been said, but you know, when we started this work 10, 12 years ago, uh, it wasn't so clear that, you know, local government had really a stake in climate change. It wasn't recognized. Now, it is recognized in the Paris Agreement, in the Glasgow uh, uh, Pact, um, and increasingly in the nationally determined contribution or national adaptation plan. So local governments, be they urban or, or rural, have a mandate for many climate-sensitive sectors. Uh, they are close to the population, but they face a funding gap. I mean, we hear it for development, but it's even more so for climate change. Climate finance is largely accessed by central government. And when it reaches the local level, it's more often through project approaches, if I can put it like that, rather than using uh, country systems as such, and therefore, you know, leading to this paradigm shift. Um, if we move to the next slide, uh, I'll go straight into the kind of, you know, details of the instruments, because that's an instrument that's been uh, essentially uh, supported, but that we also see as, as it is being introduced as an instrument that, you know, other bigger players than UNCDF can use. So uh, it, it is, in fact, an instrument of decentralization. I'm, I'm glad that both Jan and, and Frederick has mentioned decentralization as the kind of, you know, uh, range of uh, avenues to support, you know, urban development, but also urban development in connection to their ecosystems and the rural areas, perhaps. So as we work with countries, we work with central government, ministries of finance, ministries in charge of climate, ministries in charge of local governments, to help them put in place what is essentially a climate window in decentralization. So it's a long acronym, performance-based climate resilience grants, this blue box, but that you see comes in addition to other grant allocation. Important for climate finance because it has to be traced, additional and reported as such. Uh, what we do is we work with, with various partners to help access and deploy that finance to the local government level. It is essentially grant finance, although you could use that grant finance to pave the way for other forms of um, instruments, uh, small PPPs or else, or feasibility studies for larger investment. It can be deployed in both rural and urban local government. So it is a performance-based grant, so it means that there are uh, various checks and balances and incentive. Local governments have to meet certain conditions every year. Uh, for those who are familiar with performance-based grants or other forms of decentralization, it is largely aligned with that, but really with this proven additionality for climate change. Uh, local governments are invited to uh, achieve or work towards certain targets, and they have the latitude to choose across a range of sectors. This is uh, an example from a, a more rural sector menu from the Gambia, but they can essentially choose. And it's important because we've heard also from Eloisa the importance of integrated approach. Uh, it's about land, it's about green space, it's about water, it's about um, you know, flood protection. And so local governments are best placed to understand their risk in a holistic manner and then also address them through a range of, of investment. Now, if we move to the next slide, perhaps, uh, because we're also trying to not only address territorial development, 
development or urban development, but also gender issues. Uh, I'll come to that. Uh, just to just see what is the kind of footprint, the countries that are preparing or have deployed uh, this type of instrument. The first one was was Bhutan, which is now actually scaling up with budget support from the EU. So on the diagram, this little euro is no budget support, and UNCDF has stepped out, or rather, you know, help along the, the way if we are invited to by the government or by the EU. Uh, and the country, as well as others uh, in red, the one that started first, are now have direct access, um, uh, possibility to go directly to Green Climate Fund. And so we are supporting them to complement and, and therefore are uh, directly access. So uh, again, grant finance, we also see that uh, MDBs uh, are looking at the instruments, both for uh, rural and urban uh, areas as a, a way to also advance this uh, agenda. And then uh, it means that this can really uh, go to scale with a range of, of actors. Um, on the next slide, just quickly, because I know time is running, just to see these entry points for gender or inclusion uh, issues. So we, um, well, first we, we do work quite a lot through the, the planning uh, with local governments. That's really clearly an entry point for incentivizing, uh, sensitizing on the importance of gender issues and inclusion. And um, in turn, you see there the performance measures, the local governments that do better on those issues, but also other issues will score a bit better. And so it means that uh, using this instrument, if they score better, they will get a bit uh, a bigger size of, of grant and therefore they can do more. And of course their population will, will know. So it's just create this positive uh, incentive, positive emulation amongst local governments to do better on climate, on PFM, very important for this kind of instruments, of course, but also uh, from the people dimension of this work. Uh, another entry point is how we support them with the risk informed planning. Um, as we uh, help put in place climate risk assessment, clearly uh, those considerations can also be integrated. Um, and last, it is also to be uh, monitored throughout. I think I'm running out of time. There are more slides. But essentially, those are the entry points that, that we see to address in a holistic manner, um, gender inclusion, climate change through territorial development, using a programmatic approach of government that as it is put, put in place, in this case by UNCDF, others can follow through and sustain. And we see that with budget support of the EU, uh, we see that also um, possibly with MDBs and we have dialogue with a number of them to continue this work and also government itself. Uh, I think we'll skip through the last slides because um, I was uh, told five minutes so that we can exchange afterwards. Just an example of climate risk assessment and, and uh, those other uh, entry points, but happy to take the conversation forward. Thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Sophie. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us uh, from, from far away and, and for respecting the time. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, this is really really great. Uh, I know all of you have, have a lot to, to say on these issues, and so let me indeed perhaps not too long for, for the last few speakers because it would be really nice to have uh, you know some interactions and I have plenty of questions for for you, and I'm sure the audience also has plenty of questions on, on what right you do. But let me turn to uh, Julie Matri, who is the uh, Euro Mediterranean uh, Program Manager at uh, Cities Alliance. Uh, can you tell us what you're doing and perhaps in particular in Tunisia? Yes, thank you. Is it working? Can you hear me? <clears throat> no? You can hear you both. Yeah. It's yeah. not working. Not working? Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, thanks a lot for the speakers and also to the moderator. Uh, I will, many things have been already said. I will try to focus my, with my short presentation on three things. Why we need to create uh, more inclusive cities and public space, which is the title also of the today, today's session. Why we haven't done it so, so far until now, and uh, we will illustrate in fact how we can do it and we, how we can create gender inclusive public space and how we can in fact finance them through the example of Tunisia and Nepal. We have some challenges. We also talk about the challenges that we are encountering right now, also in Tunisia, and then maybe also we can discuss the Nepal case. Um, so, uh, to start, uh, it's not working, so next, <laughs> okay. so to start, uh, I think uh, every mostly every woman here today, and maybe also men, 
uh, have experienced once, uh, in, at least once in their life, uh, uh, a sense of uncomfort, uncomfort and fear when working in public space, even in Brussels. And this is even more true when we are in a city that is growing fast, as Eloisa was, was, was explaining, and where there are very few resources and basically public space are non-existent. They are not a priority. And, uh, and I think, as you can see, this is due to many uh, causes which are also connected. One is, of course, the behavioral and cultural norms that conditions the presence of women in public space, but also the lack of uh, people-centered design of public space, that is a lack of capacity, in fact, and a lack of also political interest as well in the creation of inclusive public space, in public space in general, let's say. And uh, <clears throat> there are statistics now that say that men drive more regularly than women, they use cars more often, and women are more likely to walk or take public transportation. And therefore, in fact, public spaces and urban infrastructure, apart from roads, are the ones more used by women than men. But in fact, the infrastructure funds are often pointed towards improving roadways, roadways. And this is also the case, in fact, of Nepal. We will talk about this later. Uh, rather than, for example, focusing on improving the quality and the safety of walkways, no? And this is put women and children also at a greater risk, which is also unsafe and uncomfortable. And all these reasons, I think, the why, why this is happening, we can probably identify four main uh, causes. The first one is there is a lack of, in fact, of gender-related data on urban experience and use of public space that make, in fact, women almost invisible in the cities. We don't know, in fact, how women experience and use public space. The second, which is connected, is a lack of awareness also of the importance of public space and also the capacity, in fact, of municipalities, technical departments to design public space, including also different users' perspectives, different abilities, different identities. So there is a, there is a question of capacity and awareness. The third, third one is important point, which has been mentioned already by Luisa, which is the presence of women in decision-making position, also at the municipal level, that can then influence and bring probably a different perspective. And then the fourth one, which has been mentioned over and over, is the lack of funding for such projects, which are quite small, but also important, in fact, for the life of citizens. Or if the funding are there, like we have heard, there is a lot of funding that has been programmed and go to infrastructure. There is a huge initiative with local gateways that focuses on infrastructure, but somehow the funding do not get to the municipalities and do not get to, in fact, to fund these small, very transformative projects. So the case of Tunisia is emblematic, you know. There is a, a local financial institution that gets funding from IFD, European Union, many other donors, but then the, 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 the rate, the interest rate is 7%, the municipality do not have the capacity to, to in that, be in debt even more. So I think only a couple of cities in Tunisia have the capacity to get, to, get, to get access to this funding. They don't have projects that are ready often, and they also don't have the resources to do it. So there is really a gap there. Um, so we can now focus on two initiatives that we are trying to, to establish and to uh, also improve in Tunisia. I will talk about the Famidina, which is an approach uh, that we have, uh, yeah, we have piloted in Tunis. And now we become a program uh, focusing on different cities. And we also integrated this approach in other uh, cities also where we are working in Tunisia and in the region. Um, yes, so we tried, in fact, to respond to these causes that I just mentioned with three main components. One is data collection and capacity building. The second one is really designing public spaces by women and for the community, and then support the cities to fundraise for medium-sized pro projects with a strong gender uh, focus. So. 
As you can see here, we have developed and tested different tools, different approaches, to in fact, participatory tools, in fact, to collect data, to collect women's experiences in public space, understanding, in fact, where women go, why, what kind of obstacles do they encounter, what kind of economic activities do they run, also informally, really understand where they are and what are the issues that they encounter. And, uh, and in fact, it's important also to have all this data georeferenced, so connected with space. Um, so we, we, we developed also um, maps, different maps with different topics to really understand where was more, was more significant for us to intervene. We had limited funding. We could do only demonstrative projects, small projects. And then, of course, there was a lot of work more on the policy side and capacity side with the municipality. So we developed a map of security, with access to religious and um, cultural activities, uh, living condition, economic conditions, and so on. And then, we, of, with this data, we wanted to inform back, give back this data to the community and also to the municipality, to inform them, to raise awareness about that, in fact, there is a completely different perspective that needs to be included into through the planning process. So we organized exhibitions, we, um, we, we, of course, we did everything together with the municipality. We are doing this together with the municipality, municipal team. And then there was a process based on this, and there was a process of co-designing demonstration process, uh, public spaces, and women from the community were and are involved in the definition of the projects. They own the space. So even, I don't know if you are familiar with uh, Tunisia, right now, in fact, even if there is a political change, a political crisis, the community is still there to use, maintain, and protect the space. So how we ensure, in fact, that the public space are used is by involving also the community, by involving the technical, technical team of the municipalities. They will stay, they will, they will own the space. And so these are some of the projects are quite small, so uh, a market space uh, dedicated to women with also a workshop space and a space for children connected. And then we had another space which is, uh, became now very important for the community just was open very recently and now there are also children using it, workshops and events taking place and then we did parks, libraries, um, market space and, and so on. And they are demonstrative projects because what do they demonstrate? That the space that works for women in fact improves the livelihood of the entire community. They demonstrate that the public space and design are important and they and, and this was very I think very new, in fact, even in, for Tunisian municipalities, even for Tunis, in fact, which is very, uh, there is a uh, strong capacity and so on, but still there was, in fact, an, an understanding of this. People working in municipality are mostly engineers. They are not architects, they are not urban planners. So there is also a lack of capacity or understanding of these issues. <coughs> and then, sorry, last, the last, uh, yeah, this was also, we developed a, a cultural path that connected new public spaces led by women with historical monuments and places where women played an important role. Also to reveal, in fact, the presence of women in the history of the city. And then the last bit, which is also the most challenging, is in fact the scaling up, the funding of the sustainability, in fact, of this project. These are like drop in the ocean, no? How we can make sure that then other projects, medium-sized projects with a gender uh, perspective are implemented, are funded. And we have the municipality to conduct pre-visibility studies, uh, to design medium-sized program, uh, including strong gender uh, approach and climate resilience approach. And we include them in their annual budget within their PDL, the, the, the plan, the, develop, the local development plan. And then we also help the, especially one municipality to apply for EMF for a specific project related to lights and marketplace. So this is a bit uh, the spread in the I'm finishing. And, uh, and yes, also to connect with what Sophie 
was saying, I, we can see uh, we are now in dialogue with the uh, local for Tunisia, but also for Nepal. And we see a strong uh, complementarity in what we do, in what we do and what also you can see yet, especially the local mechanism is doing. In fact, as Sophie said, no, the local mechanism is able to get the funding from international financial institutions to the government. And then the government is able to decide and prioritize projects. What we do is that, in fact, the bottom-up approach. So we help communities, women, to prioritize then their projects, design their own infrastructure and project to include them into the municipality uh, priority list. And then they are able to be selected the national government. So I think this link sometimes is missing. And we need someone to work more to, to include the criteria of local into our planning um, process and vice versa. And I think in Nepal, we can even go deeper discussing the, the, the more the funding scheme. Shortly, because we're really running out of time. Yeah. I'm sorry, Xavier, uh, but I think Thanks to Julia, but uh, it would be nice if we had a few questions. So perhaps if you said just a few words on the experience in, in Nepal and then we can have a broader discussion. Yes, um, so thank you very much. Uh, we are a bit uh, tired uh, and we want to have this discussion. So I have six slides. <laughs> so yeah, um, basically, as, as Julia said, what we wanted to actually this this project uh, from uh, Femelina had also some kind of contagious effect. And also uh, we were able to, to build a, a project and uh, we, would, we like to call it a program, right, that uh, in Nepal, uh, focusing as well in um, cities for women, yeah? and then uh, you will see um, it's focusing on, on public space. So basically, um, yeah, Dr. Sang was saying that gender uh, normally is an afterthought, right? So wh what also happens is uh, we feel also that public space and urban development is always an afterthought, no? And in Nepal, even uh, Luisa was saying no, that we are, uh, like in, in Nepal, is the highest urbanizing country in Asia, and still there is not in the priorities of the of the development development partners. So then it's uh, on us, no? Some colleagues that are here in this room, uh, urban planners that actually we've been trained and we, we are passionate about that. Um, when, uh, yeah, maybe you can go to the next slide. Yeah, so we we saw, no, before, we, we, saw the, uh, we saw the issues and then um, we we found that this priority, we, we need a place uh, where to start, right? So um, basically, Elisa also said that there is a, a big window of opportunity in Nepal. So after the uh, constitution in 2000, 2017, uh, there is a devolution of power to local governments. So in this case, uh, local governments they have uh, a lot of a lot of power. They are key key actors in the infrastructure development at local government, uh, at lo local level. Um, so there is uh, two things that, that we have identified, right? That even they have uh, resources to invest, and this is a word uh, from one of the mayors that uh, that we interviewed. Uh, they were saying, they were telling to us, we are investing following concepts of the past. No, uh, they they are they were we interviewing them. Uh, the mayors were telling us, uh, we are investing a lot of money, but again, we are building roads. Uh, we we want we would like to innovate, but sometimes in our engineering units, uh, we don't know how to do it. We don't know which direction. No, so we will. We need some international expertise and best practices on this one, and then we thought that this could be integrated in the project. Uh, next slide. So sorry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we cannot see there, but also it's investing in wrong services, right? So we have quite a typical uh, picture in uh, many um, uh, in many of these kind of forums where we say on the left we have a, a public park, a community park. Lot of, a lot of resources uh, invested there, but then it's fenced. Uh, when we were visiting there, even the community leader opened up this park and then uh, some kids came and said, can we also enter? And then the community leader said, no, no, uh, you, you cannot enter to the par this park. So then, is that public? Yeah, so the, the big question. No, but on the other hand, we have uh, an open space, yeah, vacant space in the middle of the city where actually the market happens every every Saturday, right? Yeah. And you see there, there is no service there. Yeah. It's a small shed, but it's not for, for the market. It's just a, uh, yeah, in, yeah, it's an improvised uh, space where 
the actually the people is 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 using. So again, investing the money in ground services, right? Uh, next, oh sorry. <laughs> Okay, uh, and then uh, this picture also, uh, I think uh, we took it well with, with Julia in one of the visits uh, in the far west in Sudhupashim province in Nepal. Um, this will be cro a crossing the river to go to the market. And, and then, um, yeah, so I like to, to say this, no? Planning departments without planners. So this is what is happening at the municipal level. Uh, again, what we, uh, the community, they raise the, their needs. And then these projects, they went to the engineering units, and then the, the, uh, in this case, the engineering, uh, the civil engineers, so they would do uh, what they've been trained with most of these drainage, uh, roads, and so on. And there is not be this territorial planning or this risk informed uh, in investments uh, in, the, in the city. So these pictures uh, are quite common as well, uh, sadly, in Nepal. So, next one. Yeah. Um, quickly, one thing that we want to uh, to share here is uh, Nepal is a special case, and uh, for being a Spanish urban planner, I've been uh, so lucky to participate in this in this process. Uh, Nepal is a very decentralized uh, uh, country in the decision making, and they follow a process called seven step planning process, in which the participation goes uh, to the toll, which is community groups. They generate uh, these small forums, women-led uh, organizations, even some children-led organizations, the market uh, leaders, and then they identify priorities. And this, this goes to the next step, which is the work committee, um, where all the needs from communities, they are prioritized. And then they, are, they select like two or three projects from, in, from each uh, toll. After that, it goes to, uh, from all the world, it goes to the municipal council where the municipality will assess the different projects and then they will include these, uh, in the, these projects, these needs from communities in the annual plans, which when approved, is the, is, uh, uh, they will improve, uh, implement this for the uh, next budgetary year. What's happening, this is in theory, but then we have gaps, right? So this is a process that uh, I'm telling you like, is happening even I ask mayors, I ask communities, I have different states, uh, different um, stakeholders here. All of them, they had really clear the name seven step planning process. This is followed, but it has some gaps. And we have identified main two gaps. We have more that we want to uh, tackle them in the, into the project, which is at the project identification level, in communities, they raise the needs. But then, of course, in the work committees, which projects to be prioritized, this is not always uh, clear how it is done or it, it could be more transparent, more uh, following participatory approaches. And then the last one is the implementation. Um, so that's uh, always the, a nice example is, um, so women's group, for instance, will identify that they they need more street lights in, the, in, the, in their wards, so then this project will be approved, will go through the annual plan, and then the engineering unit, they will uh, receive, you need to design a, a lighting project for this, for this neighborhood. A civil engineer, what will do, or what, is, what, what has happened, I'm telling it's a real example, he, she will go to the main road, and he, she will design lighting for this road, and this will be the lighting project for the municipality, right? So this is, uh, the supply and demand of projects and needs uh, is not matching, and this is what we are trying. We are trying to to do in this project. Can you explain why it doesn't match? Okay, yeah. So it doesn't match because, of course, uh, the women, what they, uh, the women, what they feel is that in their little streets in the neighborhoods, this is where they feel unsafe, right? That's why there is in the total development committee there is this need that they raise this need, uh, but of course. If you are only providing lights to the main highway or the municipality, uh, yeah, the need is not is not uh, starting. Yeah. So I think we are running out of time. Uh, one more slide, please. Yeah. So this is the co-financing mechanism of the project. Um, uh, basically, what we want to to mention here is that again, municipalities in Nepal they have budget to, for infrastructure development, right? 
The problem is sometimes they are investing it wrong or even they cannot spend the entire budget that they have been allocated. So the project, the Cities for Women project uh, that we are working uh, together with the uh, European Union, Cities Alliance and UN Habitat, um, what we are going to do, we have studied this co-financing mechanism where actually we are working in the project that the municipality, they have already allocated budget, let's say for a, uh, this lighting project that I, that I was mentioning before, and the project will provide capacity <coughs> building um, to improve the designs together, uh, together with the community. Uh, we'll do this uh, community uh, design, co-design. And of course, this might cost a little bit more of money, right? This is where the project will come with this challenge fund and we co-finance uh, this, this uh, community infrastructure. So basically, we are talking about 20, 30% of the overall cost of the project. What we are going to do is uh, mobilize local uh, municipal budgets to, the, um, to, yeah, to finance uh, local infrastructure focusing on, on public space. So yeah, I finish here, sorry. Uh, yeah, and thanks for, for inviting me. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to put you all yeah. under pressure, but uh, we want to have an exchange. In fact, I will ask only one question and, and directly open also. So prepare when I'm asking my question, prepare to, to jump in so that we can have for the last half hour the, uh, a, a discussion. I mean, you all presented very interesting uh, uh, approaches. Uh, Julia, you were talking about these demonstrative uh, projects, which is quite nice of you know how, how you can bring it up. But the question I would have for, in fact, all of you, how can you move from demonstrative projects, proof of concept, to something that is larger scale? In particular, knowing that you, know, you were emphasizing the importance of the local ownership, but yet we know that most of the financing is going via uh, the central government, which has a tendency, it seems to me, that to reduce the local ownership, so how can we ensure that the demonstrative projects that you are trying to, to do receive more funding from the different sources of financing? I mean, you talked about domestic, but also external, that can come and support them this and go into scale. Because I think it's you also, Julia, saying it's perhaps a drop in the ocean. And, and so my question to all of you is, are you doing something more than a drop in the ocean? Is really urbanization cities, you know, when I look at the FSD Plus and uh, Global Gateway, doesn't seem to be, uh, I think it's quite marginal type of approaches. And how can we go to a scale level, knowing also that a big problem for many of the cities in developing countries is their level of debt. So if we go, can we meet their needs with grants? Uh, and if we cannot, uh, can they absorb, uh, can they pay the, some of you have mentioned high interest rates that are not going to So that's just, but before we go to this answer, because I'm afraid that if I ask a big question, so if I give you all the floor, there will be no, uh, no time for other questions. So who would like to raise questions in the, in the audience and we connect uh, through the floor, so then you pick up whatever one you want to, to answer and go from no, Lady here. Thank you. Thank you very much, all the all the speakers. You've done a good job of telling us how your projects are going to include women in planning in urban areas, and I'm pleased about it. But I want to know. I have two questions. Those ones who have implemented, like the last two speakers, what have been the challenges in implementing these projects? That's the first question. The second one is that when we talk about gender, we are talking about women, men, children, and the vulnerable. Now, when we go into planning, and uh, I wrote a book about gender, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> and we begin talking about women, women in planning, women in this, women in that, without including the other gender, we may lose it out. How sure are you that after the grants and the projects, 
it does not remain that pilot. How do we ensure sustainability of the women inclusiveness in this planning and, it, uh, and its replication? Thank you very much. Hello, um, thank you very much, Elmonda. I am again here at work from Citizen Alliance um, on a number of issues, and in particular uh, on supporting the municipalities in their search for funding for infrastructure projects. So I wanted to mention, I wanted to, to share with you two observations uh, which made uh, in the ground, as my colleague Julia already pointed it. Um, the first um, the first one is that the funding is often, of course, available uh, through various channels. Um, but the municipalities really lack the skills to how to mobilize all this financing. Um, and this is really a key issue in the ground. And the second one is that uh, about local financing institutions, we made the constatation that including public institutions that receive funding from official development <coughs> aid to, to finance local projects, but uh, they are charging, really they are charging excessively high interest, in, interest rates, which discourage municipality from taking on debt. Then um, these secondary cities have a very low debt capacity, and uh, as you know, so really I wanted to share these observations with you and to ask you, perhaps the European Union, or to how we can strengthen the capacity of cities, really, and above all, how uh, you can influence also the uh, local financial institutions to, to lower their, their interest rates, uh, because this, they, we, we, we did the constatation that uh, in, in the ground they did not play their role, really. Thank you. There was a question uh, in the back here. Hi, um, my name is Elena. I work in the European Commission also. I'm also an architect and planner and very topical here. But I work in the emergency management department in GECO and particularly the issues of emergency shelter. So how do we provide housing to population immediately in the aftermath of the disaster or displacement um, in conflict? And we are constantly confronted to the same issue. How do we create public spaces even in the emergency uh, support? That's something I'm really insisting in the projects I have the chance of working. But my question would be, uh, especially because uh, we got Nepal and we also have a colleague online uh, in, in Kampala, so Uganda, which are cases where I've seen, especially in, in, in Uganda, I have the chance of seeing a lot of uh, examples about how to link emergency and what, how an emergency settlement becomes a city. But I'm wondering in the case of Nepal, whether you've seen uh, initiatives that are aiming at linking this emergency support and how women are uh, involved in emergency support, uh, housing or emergency planning, and whether this actually has a, a way on linking to the future. Because as uh, Elisa was saying at the beginning, you cannot plan for urbanization, but you definitely cannot plan for a disaster. So within this chaotic, happening of creating a public space how do we make it so that our projects link with your projects and there is not that horrible and administrative line between emergency and development which is so crucial thank you there was one here and one here um, good afternoon um my name is nana um from, from Department of Human Settlements in South Africa. Um, I think my question is related to Eloisa. Um, I think the, my first question is covered in, related to capacity, which was of interest. But you mentioned um, the point around rural in, um, investment in rural areas. Um, if perhaps you can elaborate in terms of specific examples. Why is it of interest? It's one of the areas that we are looking into in terms of um, kind of mitigating um, internal migration. Um, are there specific examples in terms of how we've invested in rural areas and, uh, and the impact thereof? Thank you very much. Thank you, and last question here. 
Um, thank you. My name is Anika. I work for ECDM, colleague of SAM. Um, I have a question for the colleagues from the European um, Union. Um, it's about the uh, Global Gateway that you mentioned, the Spectrum Initiative. And so you mentioned also that there is one pillar on climate um, and energy. And we've seen so far that a lot of um, climate related projects were focusing on energy projects, so so called mitigation projects. So and in the cities that we have been discussing, there is a strong need for uh, adaptation and resilience building. So how do you guarantee that there is sufficient support going to um, resilience building and adaptation under the, under the Global Gateway Initiative? Thank you. OK, thank you very much. A lot of questions. Who wants to start? Do you want to start, Louisa, <laughs> the first go? Sure, I will, I will pick a couple. <laughs> of, of, uh, of questions. First, uh, to your to your question, my point was that uh, with internal migration and people going from rural to urban areas, they will send money back to their rural areas. So, um, and this is something that is very clearly happening in Nepal. So it's kind of uh, let's call them internal remittances, uh, and this is this is why some of the money that is being generated in urban areas is actually benefiting rural areas, uh, especially for investment in, in agriculture, in, in, uh, uh, in different materials needed to, to, to promote agricultural practices, etc. And also, of course, investment a lot in housing or improvement of housing uh, stock. And this is something we see this a lot in, in Nepal, you know, that a lot of money that is coming back to the rural areas is coming actually from the city. Um, <clears throat> to the question of our colleagues in ECHO, we are really happy to report that we work very closely with our colleagues in ECHO. And uh, in Nepal, uh, I would put two main areas of, uh, of focus of how we do the Nexus, because there is a lot of preparedness uh, being worked on in Nepal. And uh, ECHO is working a lot on disaster response uh, services at urban level uh, in, in different areas of Nepal. And we are trying to make sure that some of the some of the municipalities where we work are some of the municipalities where ECHO is working. Uh, and then the second point is about land use management. And especially this planning, is a, it's really about making sure that areas that are disaster, disaster prone are not being used for building and especially uh, habitat. But this also brings into question the, the, the question of public space um, and how you can use public space in case of a disaster. I mean, this was a good and bad example when I was in Haiti after the, after the earthquake, every single open public space was used uh, for, for shelter. And this took years and years and years to be uh, to be really absorbed back into communities. Uh, so there is a very good opportunity when you have open spaces in the city, when you have a disaster, in order to be able to respond quickly. But then you also have to have the mechanisms that allow you to reabsorb back and to go back to a, to a normal solution. I will take just these two and then. Yeah, maybe I can, maybe I can pick up a few of the questions you talked about um, scaling up and ownership. Um, let's be clear, we've had a, a, a COVID crisis, and now Russia's invasion has uh, pushed up interest rates for everybody, it's caused a few security issues, it's caused massively increasing commodity prices. So money is tight everywhere, um, and it's got much worse in the last uh, few years. So it's not as if uh, there's, uh, there's money ready to be available, but it's, it's uh, uh, the first point was made on the, the capacity of public municipalities to access the funding. I mean, firstly, it's about capacity building. Um, and uh, as you say, municipalities do have a limited ability to raise funds to pay back debt. So it's not a good idea that some municipalities take on debt. So therefore, we work on the tax system as a whole. As I said, throughout public financial management, we need to look at the tax system as a whole. And how do you, uh, you see in some countries where the tax systems are more skewed towards uh, taxing uh, big business, there's no income tax. So we're working with the IMF and other, um, and the World Bank on how to improve the, the tax take, so domestic revenue mobilization. Um, and that's at the, the national level, but also very important for municipalities. Um, there's no, uh, no point borrowing if you can't pay tax, so it, it is an issue. Uh, what we're trying to do with the Global Gateway is to de-risk and um, 
I think the challenges we're looking at, the objectives we're trying to achieve are basically the uh, sustainable development goals. And those uh, to uh, finance the sustainable development goals, ODA is not uh, sufficient, it's far from sufficient. It needs private sector uh, and it needs uh, everybody, uh, and it needs private sector to money to, uh, to, to get involved. And that's what we're trying to do also with Global Gateway, to leverage uh, the private money. There's, there's, there's a lot of private money out there in funds looking for uh, investments. And part of Global Gateway is um, de-risking um, uh, investments <coughs> to make the private sector comfortable with um, investing in uh, areas where they wouldn't want to invest, where there is a positive return, but they need to be shown that uh, it needs to be demonstrated to them that there is a feasible investment there. Uh, in some countries, uh, local banks, it's much easier for them to take the high interest rates offered by uh, the governments on their local currency uh, debt, which the government's issue, and they don't want to be bothered with uh, having to do um, uh, due diligence, credit risk assessments on uh, on uh, investment projects. So what also we do is we provide capacity building to local um, banks, also through AFD, through KFW, the European Investment Bank. Um, and this is also part of what we're doing through Global Gateway. We need to build capacity of local financial institutions to get more involved in the real economy rather than just borrowing, uh, just uh, investing in government debt. Um, and by that we mean getting them to get comfortable with uh, assessing the credit worthiness of uh, small businesses, uh, even individual businesses, and not, not uh, requiring them to take 100% uh, collateral. Um, so these are some of the areas we're working on. But it's not, uh, it's, not, it's not as if there's money out there, but we have to work on tax, we have to work on de-risking, we have to get people comfortable, and particularly the private sector comfortable with, uh, with uh, uh, taking a bit more risk. And that's what we're trying to do with um, EFST Plus, uh, trying to access some of that, that private money, which there's a lot of private money out there. And as you see, the world has become more unequal and the money is sitting there at the top, and that needs to be, we need to get access to that and get it invested in where people need it and where in public services as well. Thanks. Perhaps keep passing the mic over to Frederick, because IFD, Agence Process de Développement, you're doing a lot of sovereign lending, but you're also one of the banks, I would say one of the few banks that is also doing a lot of sub sovereign so not only central government, but the local uh, level lending. What are some of your experiences and you know, the challenges that you have encountered in these? in this kind of dimension too. I'm trying to combine my questions and the other questions that we have also of the challenges. I would take the example of uh, financing directly the city of Dakar. So it took place in 2008 and at that time I was a testing leader for this project. So I can tell you that it was quite difficult in Germany <laughs> and also in, in Senegal. Um, we had many, many uh, discussion with the Treasury uh, in, in Senegal and, and internally with our uh, parliament ministers because the uh, French Development Agency is uh, uh, one of the person state own uh, bank, uh, so with our own French Treasury. Um, what we did exactly, exact, we used the same methodology. First, we, we did a, a PIFA, um, a PIFA uh, assessment which is public expenditure and financial accountability. And it was financed uh, through a city alliance, I must say. <laughs> I must say. Uh, so with this methodology, it's not a rating. Uh, it's, it shows us what are the uh, um, main difficulties for a city like Dakar to access to financing. Because at that time, Dakar didn't, has never bought before. Um, so we, we've seen that, for example, we need more transparency of the budget, we need more predictability uh, of the transfer from the central government to the city of Dakar, etc. So we, using a city-to-city -city cooperation, it was Marseille, uh, they helped the, uh, the technical team in, in Dakar to improve the capacities of, I would say, budget monitoring. And uh, also we work uh, on uh, supporting the decentralization process uh, in Senegal in order that yes, local governments, and especially the city of Dakar, has the capacity to, uh, to collect more local revenues from, from markets, from uh, also from local taxes, uh, etc. Uh, and we, we put some technical assistance to do that. And then we prepared with them their investment program. And at the time, the, the mayor said, our uh, priority first is to finance the uh, street lighting program. 
Uh, and for us, it was quite, I mean, it was unsurprising because we thought that um, maybe the first thing to do was to finance solid waste management, etc., etc. But it told us only uh, a third of the uh, different uh, uh, parts of Dakar uh, had street lighting. So he wanted to put street lighting in every part of the territory of uh, Dakar in order that the, all the citizens they really have the feeling that they belong to this uh, to this city. They are really part and they are very well considered by, by the by, by the city of Dakar. So we did that, of course, with renewable energy, etc. Because uh, we prepared it and we proposed a loan to the city of Dakar uh, without a guarantee from the, the uh, treasury. Uh, it was quite hard at that time for me as a plastic leader to have a discussion, uh, to a strong discussion with our waste department. Uh, we took a security, which is, um, what you say, an escrow account. That is to say that part of the revenues collected by the municipality is going into a bank account. Uh, so that's a security for us in order if there is a financial problem. Uh, also, the central government has is facing financial difficulties to give the central uh, financial transfer to, to the uh, to the city of Dakar, so we can cover that, that risk. And we did that uh, using a um, lot of concessionality, that is to say, blending with transform subsidies into uh, uh, when we are lowering the interest rate. So it was uh, it was um, it was possible to offer. I, I wanted you interest rate exactly, but it was very low uh, and. And we adapted to the capacity of the city of Dakar, so it worked, and and it had a demonstrative effect that the, the, in 2009 and 10, the uh, city of Dakar, after taking a loan from AAB, they took a loan from two other private banks and also from IFC. So it was a demonstrative effect that was our goal. Uh, so now they have the capacity, they are. They have the robustness, they, they, are, they have a rating, uh, so, so they, can, they can, yes, you can ask for a loan to, uh, to different financing. That's a good, good example to, to see that if we're innovative and responding to local uh, demands, that's good. We can do quite a lot. Uh, Sophie wants to also uh, provide some. Thank some you. Answers. Be quick so, uh, for all of you, so then we can take perhaps a second round also for the people who are online and have raised some, some questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just would like to contribute to the question about going to scale. Uh, I mean, it was a bit uh, rapid, the presentation, but the, on the map I projected, some of the countries that were in red had actually already achieved some level of scales, uh, up to 100 local governments in, in Bhutan. Now, you might say it's a small country, but nevertheless, running that mechanism, uh, you know, with 100 local governments simultaneously every year with the checks and balances and the climate ad additionality is already quite, you know, uh, an interesting um, case. Uh, larger countries like Mozambique are running this with 40 districts. It's a very large country, very remote areas to monitor. So I think that's also an interesting case. And what we see is that uh, as you know, perhaps a project uh, helps country put in place this kind of financing mechanism, um, you can see that the government worked through a sequencing of aid. So in Mozambique, for example, you have five diff different uh, bilateral partners using the same system. And so that's how you can well, achieves economies of scale and more funding reaches the population, but also sustain through time, you know, an instrument uh, independently on the project, which might at times you focus on a coastal area or another province or maybe more on agriculture, some, some kind of, you know, uh, important thematic for, for the, the, the partner. But uh, nevertheless, the government uh, with the dual leadership can federate efforts. So I think programmatic approaches is something that's also part of the solution. And we've run a, a longitudinal study of, of this kind of work on, on decentralization, not for climate, but before. And uh, we, we've, we've seen, you know, a, a progression from re literally millions to to billions from the, the first few millions that UNCDF might have put us, uh, government or MDBs or, or bigger players come and use the same system that is really the magnitude of the scale that we see happening. And that's documented for decentralization. Uh, and some countries like Solomon Island, for example, have fully taken on them uh, the running of you know, their own capa um, provincial uh, capital development fund. And, and we uh, so we anticipate the same form of, of journey uh, for climate change, except 
except that, of course, countries are negotiating for you know climate finance to also be supported by uh, developed countries. So that is somehow you know a, another element. But we do see uh, government now putting co-financing. Uh, like the Gambia, in between projects that they might hope to get from various partners, they sustain it themselves already. Uh, and that's just after a four-year project of the EU in the Gambia, they are sustaining it themselves, then trying to uh, attract uh, more support. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let, let's take some of the questions online, so then when we continue the, the round of answers, we can also answer the questions. We have to finish at uh, 4 o'clock. Can you just... Oh, yeah. Read them for me. Uh, uh, how to scale, Gabriella Robba asks, uh, how to scale up the small women-led projects at community level to city-wide strategies and inform at all the VC level? Which is the same question. Yeah, yeah exactly, very, very similar. Uh, then one on the seven-step process in Nepal is similar to a participatory... Yeah. Similar to a participatory uh, procedure applied in Rwanda, the gap I noticed there is as well in the identification and prioritization projects, but also how these projects are connected to the special planning tools were existing. This is more of a comment. Uh, I guess you can address it. Or, or uh, how are local architects and planners being included in the process of project implementation? Yes, yes, please go ahead. No, just behind me, feel free to read this. No, it was <laughs> it's fine. They all uh, imagine. Uh, no, uh, I will uh, answer maybe quickly to the two questions. So uh, I think uh, the, the first question is really the scaling up. Uh, it's really also a question for us. Uh, I think also what came out from uh, today's exchange is also that collaboration is key. Also among UN agencies, among the different actors. And as you can see, you know, we have to work on the capacity at the local authorities, uh, all the national government to raise awareness through these demonstrative projects. To me, these are key to demonstrate that there is a value. And then we have to work at the policy level to, to keep the sustainability, to, to have planning in place. And then there is uh, a mechanism like uh, the one that we are trying to establish in Nepal, no? Uh, with grant, uh, co-funding mechanism with grant to really support those cities to fund the medium-scale projects. And then there is the aspect of project preparation for a bigger program and trying to bridge and connect with the type of mechanism that UNCDF, for instance, is putting in place at the national government to help cities to other, have access to this type of funding. Um, on uh, the question on how we integrate planners and architects, uh, in Tunisia now, we are trying to include students from uh, universities into the data collection and also design, students from the architecture school, and also in Nepal, we are, we are planning to do the same um, because we believe that it's very important also to engage the new generations uh, and often the curricula of architects is not really linked to the real needs of the cities, even where they live, so it's very important to bridge this. And maybe I can also reply to the question because I hadn't addressed really about is gender about only women or about children and uh, people with disability. I uh, so I think this, uh, this this project, this approach that we presented, took really a feminist approach to planning, which uh, I, I believe is quite transformative because can be put in practice. And the feminist movement also, I, I believe, as a political movement was able somehow to embed also the voices of many other minorities and many other rights, LGBT plus, plus um, uh, communities, uh, children. I think there is a potential if we create cities that are designed also for uh, women's need to create cities that are inclusive for everyone. So I don't think it's an exclusive process. It's in fact an inclusive process. This is my... Yes, if I can further my question, in Uganda, let me talk about Uganda. In Uganda, when we started including women and they created a ministry which was women in development, and we began that approach, which you're using, it failed because the boys and men were now, because of our cultures, they were now 
they were now pushing those projects aside until we created a ministry of gender. Maybe in the future, you think about that. Because some cultures, when you say women, 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 they tend to back away and say, let them go alone. And then you find that the project is not clicking. Now, in Uganda, what we have noticed today is that when we created gender, the women champions were there and the men champions. Then the, the boys now are feeling left out. So we have to do something, find a solution. Um, yes, I think men need to be included, but I think men can be feminists. It's not feminism, it's only for women. And I, I, I believe that we need in, in different countries, we need to have different approaches, a different entry point. So what is working in one country is not working in the other. So the entry point of women empowerment can be right in one place, but can be a different point. Let me just say, okay, I So we really have to close at four o'clock. So I, I, I suggest, especially for those that are here, that we can continue just after the, the you know, after the, this meeting, we can continue the discussion. So I, I want to give just one minute to uh, Xavier. Uh, then uh, Eloisa wants to have also one sentence, and we'll let Tuli uh, close down the, the meeting and all this in the last few minutes. Okay, uh, challenge accepted. Okay, so um, the, I want to address the question regarding spatial planning tools and local architects. So actually, with the same answer, we found that in Nepal, for instance, uh, in the municipalities, the, the, there is no provision for uh, public servants for architects in the municipality. So the project actually wants to change that in the, in the national policy, so then architects can access to have a seat in the municipality. Otherwise, uh, this linkage is not there. And regarding the humanitarian aspect, of course, we have the preparedness side, where uh, of course we need to, um, you know, uh, risk land sensitive um, uh, use uh, plans as well. This has to be the, the, the municipality; they have to have them, right? But on the other hand. When I was talking with uh, ADB colleagues, and then they were saying, okay, it would, be ha it would have been great after the Nepal earthquake uh, 2015, we would have had a, a budget line for public space, you know, in, there, right? So then afterwards, I, I could actually fund this project easily, easily, easier for us, right? So uh, this is something uh, sometimes it, it lacks. Right? Thank you. Yeah, so very quickly again on this question of, of sustainability and the drop in the ocean. So I think we have to think also about uh, our funding, our cooperation funding. No, it's not a drop in the ocean, but maybe it's a class in swimming pool. So, <laughs> so it's a different proportion. But then what can you do? And what you can do is you can work on changing the rules of the game. Because you may not have the money to, to intervene at the big level. But you can change the rules and work on the policy to make sure that when the money is, comes, where, wherever it comes from, that is being used in the right way. And the second point is that we are talking a lot about our different types of funding, our big private funding, but we are maybe neglecting the biggest uh, creator of city, which is a small private investment. And this is also one that we need to channelize and we need to make sure that it's actually building positive and uh, qualitative spaces. And this is again working on policy. Uh, Thanks, Eloisa, because I think this is very important. Beyond the direct impact of the project, it's very important to think about the process you are, uh, you are stimulating and, and the catalytic effect. So it's perhaps you know, nobody is asking the EU to finance all cities around the world. But the catalytic effects that uh, you know international actors can have is really key. Uh, that will be the last words for me, and <laughs> let me turn to to Lee for uh, for wise closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lau, and to the the panelists for such an amazing, amazing interaction. We would like to thank Eloisa as the dean, um, Ian Hoskins, Frederick, 
address. So here the topic, Zahir, Halasif, and this, and Jamila. It's very clear that the projects we've just heard about are transformative in their nature. The idea being to demarginalize women's experiences in public spaces and put them at the center of planning green public spaces. Yes, of course, there will be difficulties in that some men might resist. But it seems to me that going forward, when men resist, we don't yield, we involve them, but still do not place them at the center of planning because the reason women have been the reason women have been excluded is because public spaces have been tailored by and primarily based on the needs of men. And when we put women at the center, it is meant to be transformative in that it should be responsive to the needs of everyone because we are we're coming for the lowest denominator. We're coming for the lowest denominator. But having said that, it is important that when there's a backlash, by then it is sorted out immediately and we find champions within those spaces. For me, I hope the settlements in South Africa will noted this, even though we may not be part of this program, but there are ideas that we can borrow what's happening in Nepal, Tunisia, and other places. Thank you. 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 Thank you.